Well, I think we're returning to a more sort of normal investment climate slowly but surely, you know, really since 2008. I think investors um, and uh, investment professionals as well have been kind of waiting for the next disaster. And it's been somewhat justified. You know, there have been a lot of risks out there uh, that the market has been nervous about. There's clearly a withdrawal of liquidity that's take, that took place, you know, post-2008 with banks closing and dealer desks being cut back and things. But slowly but surely, we're sort of working our way through and eliminating a lot of those risks. So if you think of some of the big risks that are, have been out there, we never had a, a central forecast that, of a disintegration of the euro that was clearly being, was, was nervous and a lot of pressure in the market. The uh, near-term provisions that have been put in place to provide liquidity and access to liquidity for Italy and Spain and some of the other economies there have really, you know, put that back the way we've kind of viewed it, and that is a long-term structural workout, muddle through sort of scenario overall, but taking away that near-term uh, volatility risk. You think about, um, the uh, fiscal cliff issues in the U.S. The distinction there as we get closer, I think, to the end of the year and to the election and comparing it to the European situation is you really have two parties um, that are negotiating there. And game theory is going to mean that they are going to uh, come perilously close to a, to a, a structural problem. But the likelihood that um, one, you know, that, that, that in a two-party system like that, that one party gets held accountable if there is a, a major disaster is high. So I think that it's in both their interests to back off and sort of move away from that. China's slowdown and the effect on the global economy has been a big story here. And what we're really seeing, we think, is a transition from China as an export-led economy into China with a domestic, more domestically driven economy. And while they're probably not growing at they're not growing at 10% anymore. Um, the debate around 5 or 6 or 7% will have implications for, for different markets domestically and externally for out of China. But that, and that transition will be bumpy, but it doesn't look like it's going to drive a, a global recession sort of scenario that was there before. And lastly, the Middle East um, had flared up with um, Iran and Israel looking like they were, uh, you know, fairly on, on the verge of imminent confrontation. That also seems to have stepped back a little bit. Israel, we think, has taken some steps to kind of uh, modify their stance that will mean that, you know, that that, that, that looks less, uh, less problematic down the road. So... We're not projecting a, you know, a booming recovery in the U.S., and clearly Europe has some big structural workouts. Japan has some problems that have been around for a long time. China, uh, slower than we thought. But markets were being priced for imminent disaster, and without imminent disaster, um, I think, you know, risk assets can st continue to do pretty well. I think the European Central Bank has clearly made a lot of progress with these most recent introductions. Uh, most of the story around Europe, in our minds, has been about liquidity risk in the near term rather than the long-term uh, structural or default risk down the road. So through these programs, essentially, they have uh, provided um, Italy and Spain and some of the other economies near-term access to capital that really uh, takes the liquidity pressure out of the story and allows them to address some of the structural issues that we think that, they'll, that they're working at down the road. I'm mean, talking about what's the biggest hurdle. I mean, the biggest hurdle is really, I, I guess there are two of them. And one is time, because this is a, a, a situation that cannot be solved uh, quickly. It will require you know, walking down a fairly narrow path, and there's lots of pressures on either side of that path that could knock you off. So you have to kind of, uh, you know, they, they've got to navigate through a fairly narrow window over an extended period of time. And the second big hurdle is that unlike the U.S. two-party system, when you're looking at the European debate, there are a lot of constituencies, a lot of embedded interests on, you know, on, 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 you know, in countries, in the, in the uh, public sector, in labor unions, et cetera, that need to be worked out. And it's hard to know who's driving the bus at any given time. And the likelihood that one of those constituencies throws a wrench in the net, in, 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 into the mix is still fairly high. And what we've seen, and this is also sort of a game theory situation, is that as markets stabilize and it looks like there's some negotiating, you know, some, some flexibility, the sides back off and they tend to get more uh, confrontational again until, the, you know, it's only with the market stress in place that they really, uh, th that we really see any progress. So they're going to have to be navigating that, uh, that window, I think, for some time, and that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's a still a fairly big hurdle. What it means maybe is that, you know, that the... Um, that we, we don't have any real good prospects for robust recovery or strong economic growth coming out of the European region for some time. You know, this is going to be kind of a slow, slow workout. But expectations are very low 
And so it doesn't have to, you know, as long as we don't get a, a, a real disaster, uh, I think the markets generally will take that as a positive sign and move forward.